deceptively difficult piece to play, I have to say. I'm supposed to be on that side of your arm, but apparently. Sorry, I'm going to go around. Mm -hmm. um, deceptively difficult piece to play. I'm, I'm imagining that some people at least know that it was originally written for the horn, um, which tells us something about the lack of balance issues that there would have been with um, the original instrumentation. So I'm going to thank Gemma very much too for having been such a brilliant yeah. one. Because these Schumann piano parts are famously difficult to actually tame and keep under control. So thank you very much. I mean, we've, we've talked about whether we should lower the piano or not, the lid, and I said, well, let's see what happens. And I don't actually have, I don't think anybody, if anybody thinks that we should lower the piano, they'd say so, but I thought that was actually fine. I was standing at the back, so let's leave it. Brilliant, well done. Um, yeah, okay, so written for a horn. The sort of phrasing that we might employ if it was a horn, the sort of sound balance, the sort of, the sort of marvelous verticality of it. Ba 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 which I think is wrong for the piece, wrong for the accompaniment that we have here. So the challenge is to dig out the sound <coughs> on the second of note of the slur, the E natural, okay? And if I were you, I wouldn't worry too much about taking it off the string. I would leave it more on the string, so the whole thing is full of substance, rather than, if you go back to early romantic principles again, just because the note has a dot on it doesn't mean to say that it's spiccato. And of course, the only two that do have dots in here, this position anyway, the first is ba, ba, ba. Okay, I would say it means you mark them, as in fact you were doing. Otherwise, I would risk trying to put it on the string, okay? The problem is that when you do that, you don't always get deep into the string. And I'm just, I was even looking at the camera over there to get a better view of what your right hand was doing. I'm wondering if you could think of the possibility of bending your right thumb a little bit on the down pose. Because what happens is you stay a little bit stiff in your thumb and this side of your hand, which means that you're she's pushing down into the string instead of putting it sideways. What tends to happen is you go that way, okay? And that's mostly could be triggered by the fact that your thumb needs to bend on the down bow, okay? But I don't know if you've ever been told that or thought about it or wondered about what's happened to the last three years just to me. Oh, ouch, ooh, sorry, okay, right. <laughs> no, nothing else, no, thank you. Yeah, but, but the thing is that I don't want to make a hard and fast rule about this because we're all built differently, you know, we have different sort of strengths in different parts of our hands and so what works for one person is not necessarily going to be a, you know, a hard and fast rule for somebody else. But in principle, that dropping of the wrist, the bending of that fourth finger, the dragging the thing down that way, this way, is going to give you more power without downward pressure, which tends to throttle the instrument. So what I'm going to suggest is, can we just start this, maybe without you for a second, Gemma, can we just start this and leave it on the string like this? So you have textbook. And you're not going to worry about you're going to play almost double stop. And your thumb, right thumb, is going to bend. Yeah. Okay. Super fast learner. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And the problem is whether you can do that at the speed you need. But my feeling is if you don't try and take it off the string, but you just do, we're going to, I'm leaving the same notes, but the bow string is the same, right? Yeah. Then we're going to get the articulation we need anyway. Right? That's what we're going to get. That's the 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, that's a reason why some people actually play it starting with an up bow. I'm not suggesting that either. But some do. What would that do to this spiccato? It would completely remove it. In other words, the notion is it's not spiccato. It's not taking off the strings. Yeah. Right? So it's going to sound more like a horn, actually. <laughs> right? <laughs> All right. Then. Um, let us let us just start the beginning of this. And if you wouldn't mind going a touch slower. So you can on the Allegro. On the Allegro. Okay. I want to see if we can reduce the sound. But I'm th but speed, I'm thinking. So you can worry about that thumb. Okay. Don't go faster than that. Okay. <laughs> so it means you're going to go. then is you're going to have to worry about putting a second finger and stopping a fifth before you get there so it doesn't go okay that third finger is going to go down early so you can play it absolutely legato across the string properly right that's me so just so you can think ahead, we only think, think, people think you can think of more than one thing at a time, you can't. You can only think of one thing at a time. So we've got to give ourselves the time to be able to think one thing at a time, but very quickly one after the other. Okay. Okay. sounds much worse than she when she played before. <laughs> and I don't care. I, that's putting in the ingredients which I think are essential to being able to play, play the piece faster. What you'll then discover is for yourself you will hear when you need to nourish notes with your left hand, in other words vibrato. Yeah. That sort of bow application is going to demand a different sort of life in your left hand. Yeah. And that's the way you're going to find it. But initially you go with the bow, just like that, okay? So, that was easy. Um, I'm going to go back to the beginning of the piece, if we may. But can I just mention one little thing? I mean, I don't know that I would do your bowings. I mean, I, as I was saying the other day, I find it more difficult as I get older to ignore natural gravitational things, which means the down bow being drawn by gravity is a very easy bow to put. It also has a lot of weight at this end, natural weight. The up bow is naturally lighter because the bow gets lighter here. So there's a na natural diminuendo on the way up. You get a natural crescendo. We have to fight against gravity to have an up bow. So, as I get older, because I get infinitely more and more lazy, I want to work with gravity more than the opposite. Yeah. Okay. Although I understand why these things are done. What you did was to start with an up bow. Yeah. Because? Uh. Yeah, I know, because you were told to do it, but think of another, <laughs> reason. <laughs> think of another reason for the moment. Because at least we're supposed to understand yeah. why we're told to do this. Right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um. So that way you do a down bow. Um, which is the most important note. Because? It's the most important note. If I asked you to take the first four bars and call bar one one, bar two two, bar three three, etc. etc. and I said one, two, three, four, classical hierarchy, what would you say? Which would have the stress, which would have the release? Because what we're going to do is contradict a couple of things here, but I want to know what we start with. One, two, three, four. Which is the strongest? 
of a classical hierarchy of a 4-4 four, four bar. Three. One, two, three, four. One, we're going, we're one, going two, right three, back four. at least 300 years here. Okay. One, two, three, four. Uh, one, I heard one. Good. Yes, terrific. Fantastic. Okay, then. One and four. One, two, one, two, four. One, two, three, four. Ah, three, fantastic. Three, one, two, three, four. One, two, two is weaker. Three is a little bit stronger, but not as strong as one. Four is the weakest. Okay, that's the basic format, right? Then we can start contradicting it, because we're talking poetry here, and we're allowed to bend the rules and do all sorts of things. Yeah. Okay. Right, so go back to the original argument. One, two, three, four. Or one, two, three, four. Is the second bar the most important? Yeah. Necessarily the most important. Depends how you look at it, doesn't it? Right? So, why do we think the second bar is most important? Because Schumann writes a, a hairpin in the first bar and a hairpin down in the second bar. But supposing those hairpins don't mean get louder and get softer. Supposing they don't mean that. Supposing they mean like more like Brahms. We're going to linger on this idea because it's so beautiful we don't want to let it go. Yeah. Does that say anything about the dynamics? Not necessarily. It may, but it may not. So what you're doing is because he wrote a hairpin. What point? Yeah. He didn't write crescendo, diminuendo. He wrote a hairpin over two bars, which may suggest something completely different. Yeah. Okay, you're going to keep your bowing, all right? But the thing is, I want the piece to start. Gemma, would you play the very beginning of the piece? Okay, how much emphasis did you hear on the second bar? Could the beginning of the piece, that first note? That's the key word. Ah, it's in A flat major, right? Mm -hmm. Give me an A flat, which lasts for at least two measures. Absolutely perfectly together with the same quality of tone, the same quality of attack that Gemma can produce on this particular yeah. piano. Perfectly balanced. But the thing is, you're still going to keep your bow, but I'm just in passing, that's why I start with a down bow, right? Okay. Because I can breathe and I can let gravity produce an A flat, an E flat from us, which will perfectly balance an A flat in the piano, which is the only way she can play it. Yeah. Right? So do that with your outro. Yeah. Once again, once again, once again, you're going to have to keep everything in motion, flowing. All the rivers inside yourself flowing, flowing, arms moving, vibrato traveling before you get on the boat, right? Okay. It's already floating, it's already being carried by the current. And you're going to have to have the perfect beginning of the note, just like that. Boom. Take that. shift is it between the second finger and the third finger? Oh, okay. And exactly what are you going to practice now? Stretching. You're going to stretch? Ah, okay, okay, great, great. I like that. <laughs> Which? <laughs> You're not going to stretch. Okay, so while you're vibrating happily on your E natural, your third finger is because it can't wait to find that G, yes? Yes. Okay, so it's not going to be stuck somewhere there, it's going to be reaching already. There's going to be a gap between your second finger and the third finger. But the very action of opening that is going to affect your vibrato, which is going to make that E natural, force it, force it into being a G. It cannot, it cannot do anything with itself anymore. It has to become another note. That sort of feeling. Okay. Because you've stretched. Reaching, reaching, 
there's something in between your fingers. So you move your third finger away from your second finger, you vibrate like crazy. You are going to have music between these two notes. Okay? No stopping with the right foot. Sorry. We missed you. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so desperate to change your bowing. You can change it. Can I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it's fine. <laughs> okay, okay, just for, the, just for the experiment, and we accept that everything might go wrong, and you beat me up later, and <laughs> I told you it wouldn't work. I don't care. Okay, it's just for the experiment. Okay? Because we have to try everything. We try everything until something works, <coughs> feels right, on many, many, many different levels of our being. Okay. Yep. So, you did two, two, is that right? <coughs> Second, both of those fingers are going to be down, and you're going to be vibrating across both of them, right? Okay. So you might as well practice putting them both down and vibrating off them. Do it once again. Right, hold them both down and just keep playing. Start the beginning of the piece. Remember exactly what you just felt. And when you change from an E natural, reaching, stretching happily to fulfill yourself on a G, there is vibrato between those two notes for a split second. Both fingers are down. Off you go. Tiny, tiny little things, they make such a difference. And this is practice. It's digging out, winkling out the tiny, tiny, tiny things. Don't be impatient. Don't anybody, everybody, do not be impatient. Begin. Exactly. 
exactly what I'm going to say, right? <laughs> so you lead with the elbow, right? Yeah. Here we are. On that plane, we want to change to that plane. Which part of the arm goes first? Elbow. We're going to drop from this shoulder muscle. so many things. Bend your thumb. On the down there. Again. Breathe. Breathe together. Breathe together. in the house, I'm going to ask a, a, a request. When, I said this this morning to somebody, I think it's probably Andrew. When a string player starts a bow, we know when it's going to end. Okay? If that gets disturbed, then our sound is going to change. But supposing we know at the beginning of that note, the sound we want very much for extending the phrase past the point that I was planning. And that's not fair, is it? It's not fair, because why should we have to have that constraint? Or we'll, or we'll change both. So the most wonderful pianists we work with are those who we want to help. We want them to play as wonderfully as they can. But please bear in mind we have a limitation here. Okay. And we can slow it down. We could have started different. If you want a 30 second down there, it's true, we can do that. But it might not be the sound that I want to make. So we have to cooperate in that way. That's it. Thank you. Now, with bottom E flat, that tick the place, off you go. Just that note. Right. Okay. And then I have to ask, what type, what kind of join do you want? What sort of quality do you want at the end of the E flat before you start? Just a little gap. Where do you want to put the gap? Are you going to continue your vibrato into the rest that you've just created? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. She's pretty so brilliant. Okay. Thank you. Um, once again, the E flat. See if you can nourish the E flat in the middle of it. so they can do it. Make it ideal, make it fabulous in your head, sing it again inside your head, and listen. Listen to what happens between the B flat and the F. I don't know, I wasn't inside your head. <laughs> doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Okay. That's your performance. Okay. So, how are you going to execute that shift? I want a little slide. You want a little slide? Show us. How will you practice it? 
What will you do? So you're going one one, first finger to first finger? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Okay, it's an easy one. Right, do it again. Okay. So we want to have the brass on the B flat. We want to have a certain intensity of music between B flat and the F, and we want to have the brass on the F as well. Yeah. Okay. So I want to hear them. This is practice. You figured out the shift. That's the ingredient. That's right bang in the middle of the problem we have. What happened? I should explain what happened. What happened when you played it was that I lost the music. Mm -hmm. I lost the music between those two notes. That's why I stopped. Sorry. There was no musical tension between a B flat and an F. So I want to find out what you're doing. Okay. That's the point of the question. So your practice would have to be playing those two notes. Until you've decided exactly what you really want to hear. Keeping the vibrato continuous. Uh -huh. Which, uh -huh, right, so. but, but your vibrato stopped before you finish. Ah, better. Better. But your vibrato still stopped. at all in the shift, which makes it hard, right? I'm trying to think it's not a good thing. Well, it's, it's a useful shift anyway, I mean, you know, whether we want to use it. No, it's fine, it's fine, it doesn't matter. Yeah. If that's what you heard in your head when you sang it to yourself, how else would you do it? You'd have to ask that question. If that's an honest rendering of what you hear in your head, then I'm happy with it, keep it. But then you'd have to practice it, and it's not as easy as we think it should be. Or we just release the bow. Oh, that was easy. But ah, wait a minute, the music stopped. Problem. Yeah. Okay, that phrase. You just finished this one. Okay. Then you've got to have the ability to put down and lift a finger without it disturbing the vibrato. Right, otherwise, we, which is much worse than you did it just then. But yeah. that's the point. Okay, so looking, 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 looking closer. Because yeah. you can play wonderfully, really wonderfully, but you ignore many, many little things. And I think, by the way, thinking about how hard, it, how hard it is to start something like this, to be the first player, you know, the more detail, the, the more closely you've looked at something, the more safety nets you have in place for when you finally stand up and get absolutely terrified and still have to play reasonably. So the, the cl more closely we've looked in this way, the more chance you will produce something which you can be proud of anyway, even if you feel terrible at the time. Mm -hmm. But you didn't feel that. It was great. So thank you very much. Indeed.